Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Schilling, Senior Program Officer at the Concord Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's forum with Sue Miller and Doug Bauer on their respective memoirs, The Story of My Father, and What Happens Next, Matters of Life and Death. This program is part of the Concord Festival of Authors, and um, we are delighted to welcome you all to one of the programs for that festival. There's really an incredible series of events over the next two weeks, so I hope you can attend many of them. And Sunday night here at the museum, we are going to be hosting a forum with contributors to the new anthology of reflections on Henry David Thoreau titled Now Comes Good Sailing. Um, it was just reviewed in the New York Times last week and it was called Remarkable. So I hope you get to come and hear some of those contributors. Thank you all for being with us. I hope you enjoy the program. I'll now turn it over to Tom, Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. Thank you. So you water. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and uh, especially those of you who have forgone the paranoia engendered by a seemingly perpetual pandemic uh, to be here with us in the room this evening, and all of you who are watching from home, we're so pleased that you tuned in this evening. Uh, allow me very brief introductions, and then Doug and Sue have each chosen readings to begin with, and then we'll have a brief conversation, and we're happy to take questions from all of you. Doug Bauer is the author of three novels, three works of nonfiction, and numerous essays, reviews, and articles. He's won grants from the National Endowment for the Arts in both fiction and creative nonfiction, and teaches literature at Bennington College. Edith Perlman writes that his memoir, What Happens Next, Matters of Life and Death, respects time but is not enslaved by it, with essays that move in circular fashion among incidents that foreshadow later ones and recall earlier, a spiral history which touches us again and again. Plumbing the heart, writes Andre Dubuse, of his Midwestern family with brave and naked fairness. Now, not all of us would shed such brave, naked spotlight on ourselves, as Doug so admirably does. Uh, because I know Doug is thin and stylish, I was surprised to learn uh, that due in part to his mother's delectable cooking, uh, which we may later talk about later in the conversation, uh, and his having eaten three hot, heavy meals a day on the farm that he was growing up, he was quite a portly child, due in part to the fact that his childhood asthma prevented him from working off the calories like others on the farm <laughs> through an afternoon of sweat and effort. So I smiled at the image of you, Doug, in your fourth grade <laughs> class photo as a pudgy lad dressed in, quote, an ill-advised plaid shirt with jeans from the husky section of the local department store. <laughs> Both critically acclaimed and loved by her readers, Sue Miller is recognized internationally for her elegant and sharply realistic accounts of the contemporary family from her first novel, The Good Mother, to her most recent monogamy. Her memoir, The Story of My Father, was heralded as a beautifully spare memoir about her relationship with her father during his illness and death from Alzheimer's disease. Her numerous honors, honors include a Guggenheim and a Radcliffe Institute Fellowship. She's a committed advocate for the writer's engagement with society at large, including serving as the chair of Penn New England, which is one of the ways that we have grown to know each other over the years. Her memoir, The Story of My Father, is described by one reviewer as a perfectly pitched memoir that movingly depicts the bittersweet emotions provoked by the toll Alzheimer's exacted on her father. And I didn't ask you your reading, so I hope you don't mind I steal one of the lines, um, and maybe it won't be in your reading. A former professor at the University of Chicago and Princeton Theological Seminary, her father didn't lose all of his powers of observation. Toward the end of his life, while living in an assisted living facility here in Concord, right? Um, uh, he observed to Sue, you know, there's one thing I haven't figured out about this place. No one ever seems to graduate. <laughs> so we will begin now with a reading by Doug, followed by a reading by Sue. Thank you, Tom. 
for the invitation and for the introduction, and thanks to you all for coming. Um, Allison, am I okay now? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm going to read uh, an excerpted section from one of the essays in my book. Um, the essay is called Touching. But first I want to read just a page of the introduction to kind of give you a sense of uh, what I'm up to in this book. Um, in my early 60s, I should say when I was in my early 60s, and still extraordinarily lucky in my health, I became aware that three key and disparate parts of me were showing common signs of rare. It was as if they would colluded in a devilish partnership and to simultaneously launch the beginning mischief of age. First, the cataracts had long been ripening in both eyes had reached the stage where they needed to be removed. In addition, I'd been feeling my heart begin to now and then beat too rapidly for any reason I could trace. And finally, my arthritic left knee, a problem for decades, most of its cartilage surgically removed when I was 21, was suddenly much crankier, stiffer, more painful. So I scheduled a month of appointments and tests and for the cataracts routine surgical procedures. I organized everything into a quick, convenient cluster because I was going to be away from home for some months. But also looking back, I see myself irrationally imagining that if I attended to these matters in a wholesale sweep, it would be as if I were doing away with the evidence that age had found me and settled in to stay. Arranging the calendar, I had no suspicion that the push of narrative, the stuff of story, was in it. But I had no suspicion either that my mother would die on the morning of that calendar's first day. Um, so the, the book that resulted from the surprise of my mother's death and my own sort of creeping toward mortality uh, was a matter of looking at these kind of dual narratives of age her sudden death and uh, my ever, being ever more reminded that, that the death was out there for us all. And the essays uh, kind of move back and forth between paying a lot of attention to thoughts and episodes from my life with my mother and then also my own sort of experience with this, those procedures and, uh, that I described in the introduction. So with that as the context, if you will, uh, I'm going to read from this essay, Touching. In the years I knew my grandfather Evans, he bore no resemblance to the man I later learned of from my mother's recollections, the profane coal miner working the Midwest's meager bituminous load, whose nightly drinking started once he'd finished scrubbing himself clean from his day beneath the ground, and continued through supper and his remaining waking hours, turning sullen or worse inside his nightly booze. As a boy, I saw him almost every Sunday when many of his nine children and their families gathered to eat and spend the day. But then he'd become a withdrawn invalid in his huge, shabby, maroon-colored armchair, smelling of pipe tobacco and a kind of lingering fungal rankness, sitting still as a squalid Buddha, listening on the radio in the summer to his beloved Chicago Cubs lose, emitting a startling falsetto, woo-wee, when Dee Fondy or Gene Baker or the great Ernie Banks hit a home run. But mostly, as I said, sitting eerily quiet in his overalls and slippers in the corner of his tiny living room next to the big coal stove an ancient water stain in the shape of South America on the wallpaper behind him. I remember watching his fingertips press tobacco into the bowl of his pipe, loose strands sprinkling the bib of his denim overalls, his fingers ochre-stained from nicotine, his neglected nails long like a woman's and curled at their ends, creepy as claws. I conjure him sitting there, smoking and staring out from beneath the bill of his accidentally dapper gray tweed driving cap through eyes that were dramatically whitened by cataracts. I don't know why his cataracts were left to grow 
though in his time, he was born in 1881, they were not routinely removed. The techniques and instruments were still relatively crude, and there was also the matter of his lifelong poverty. The answer then may be as simple as his having had neither the money nor the health. He suffered from other disabilities as well, including what I assume was a relatively contained case of black lung. His coughs when they came were fits of high inhuman sound that took possession of him and shook him in his chair. When he did leave that chair with a struggle in stages, he walked with wooden crutches, which creaked to my ears like a horror movie sound effect with each slow step. But it was most of all his blindness that mesmerized and spooked me. The impression his whitened eyeballs made changed with the mood of my imagination. Sometimes I thought of them as scrims of tiny clouds. Other times his cataracts looked hard as shells of porcelain. As adults, we are disgusted and threatened by deformity. But when we're children, we're better than that. There's infatuation in our fear, and our, and our disgust is something sensual. We want goblins and witches in our worlds. They take our days and our dreams to a place beyond the ordinary, where days and dreams belong. And no witch, no goblin worth his salt is not deformed or frightening. So if I didn't have a grandson's easy physical love for my grandfather, there was something in my feelings more compelling than that. In all his grims, vividness, he deliciously repulsed me. <laughs> but the charm of the goblin does not survive our childhoods, or in fairness, I should say only that it did not survive mine. I think of my reaction when I was told that I myself had cataracts, of how the news sent a signal of grotesquery and age. When I was a small boy, my first duty on arriving at my grandparents for our regular Sunday visits and the big family dinner was to report to my grandfather for what he called exercises. I assume all or most of my many cousins also had to endure this ritual, but I'm the only sufferer I remember. So before I could go outside to join the play, I stood before him in his shabby armchair and announced myself. He greeted me smiling and motioned me up onto his lap. I complied with great reluctance facing him with my short legs straddling him. I felt his long, nicotine-stained fingers wrap themselves around mine. And then our exercises began as he quickly lifted and lowered my arms, crossed them and extended them wide, drew them back and pulled them to his chest, repeating the sequence again and again, all the while keeping a strict, brisk beat with a lilting wee, 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 wee a variation of woo-wee, and like it, a sound of prepubescent joy. As much as I dreaded the thought of the exercises, once we started them, I gradually gave over to their jostling meter, and my discomfort with his touch and his tang began to fade. I sensed his strangest softening, felt him briefly, recognizably alive. This odd regimen was the way I felt him feeling. When we finished, I climbed down from his lap, almost dizzy, momentarily disoriented, and thanked him, as I'd been instructed to do. He retreated then, back into his chrysalis of frailty. You could almost see and sense it happening, his alertness to the world leaving his face in the way a drunk disappears into his drunkenness. Once I'd outgrown the exercises, become too old and too big to sit on his lap, there was no particular reason to offer him my hands, to feel his touch, to endure the sensation of his fingers slowly wrapping themselves around my wrists. And so, unless I had to, a handshake he asked for now and then, I no longer touched my grandfather. As I said, it was from my mother that I learned of his drunken meanness. She obliquely sketched the picture in bits of memory over the years. Though she never spoke of any physical violence, just his snarl, like a hostile animal, if you tried to engage him when he was drinking. She often visited the house in Colfax on days that weren't Sunday in order to assist with a task or run an errand. 
on the day I'm recalling, I was maybe 10 or 11, I went with her. Returning from the nearby playground, I opened the door, stepped into the kitchen, and aimlessly turned toward the living room. From there, it was possible to look to the right and see at an angle into my grandparents' bedroom. Doorway giving to doorway, and then the framed partial view, like an intimate Vermeer Warren. Movement from the bedroom drew my eye, and I looked through to see my mother and grandmother standing face to face beside the bed. My mother's back was to me. Neither of them sensed me. My grandmother's dress was bunched at her neck like a great ruffle. Her slip was off her shoulders and draped from her waist. The corpse whiteness of her skin was a color no palette could capture. But what shocked me were the ghoulish appendages that were her breasts, wide, flat straps of flesh that hung below her waist and ended bulbously. My mother was saying something to her, too softly for me to get her words, while she lifted a washcloth from a pan of soapy water sitting on the bed, wrung it out, and continued to wash her mother's body. My grandmother stood, patiently receiving my mother's care, their murmurs so casual they might have been trading bits of homely gossip as they knitted side by side. My grandmother was certainly able to wash herself, so I have no idea why this was happening. I turned away, shocked, disgusted. There was no goblin charm in this glimpse of deformity. It was far too vivid, far too actual. But stunned as I was, what has stayed with me is the picture of my mother's ministering care. It was as though, like a conscientious tradesman, she was applying with careful brush strokes a more expert cleanliness than my grandmother could have achieved on her own. In their postures and composure, they were Vermeer figures, absorbed in the amber domesticity of unremarkable chores. My grandfather was the first dead person I saw. I was nearly 13, and as I remember, my being readied for what to expect at his funeral consisted of my mother warning me that, quote, Grandpa won't look like himself as he lay in his open casket. I don't remember if she tried to describe what he'd look like instead. The service was held in the funeral's home chapel, a small windowless room with four screen walls. I sat between my parents in the front row of folding chairs. Family flanked us and filled rows behind us. My grandmother was not with us. Her great heft and her arthritis had by now made it impossible for her to fit into a car or climb a set of steps. The minister stood at a small podium, an organ and organist to his right, my grandfather in his casket to his left. My mother had been right. He did not look like himself. What he looked like instead was remarkably neat and clean. He'd been transformed not so much by death as by hygiene. His thin white hair was padded, parted and combed. His death complexion face was whiskless and rouge. He wore a suit and tie, surely purchased for this ultimate appearance. I'd never seen him in anything but bib overalls. He was surrounded not by ratty Bernhold maroon cloth of the chair, but by shiny cream-colored satin. I picture his body in profile in a cone of light. This is doubtless what my memory has incorrectly fashioned. If he'd, mem if he'd mes mesmerize me, sorry, if he'd mesmerize me as a blind old ghoul on crutches, the thrilling strangeness of his corpse was greater than anything I could have dreamed or imagined. I couldn't keep from looking at him. I, glancing around, I saw everyone else's eyes fixed on the minister who also did not turn or nod to my grandfather. It was as if his body was pointless to acknowledge now that his soul had risen, now that death had rid it of the stored lifetime of thoughts and feelings and left it no more relevant than a husk. Either that or the opposite, as if his corpse, all mystery and material, spirit and shape, was too overwhelmingly present 
to look at. But he seemed to me too present not to. Also, death's stillness gave him a kind of poised dignity that he'd only in death been able to achieve. And maybe because I'd watched him so often, sitting as quiet and motionless in life as he lay now, I imagined him suddenly reverting to undignified form and popping up in his coffin and sounding a woo-wee. And then I realized my mother beside me was weeping. How long she had been, I didn't know. Her shoulders were moving subtly, and she was patting her eyes with a tissue. And at last, here was something that made sense. A father was dead, and his daughter was sad. Or did and did not make sense. For I was surprised to see her weeping. As I understood emotions and what they signaled, her weeping was evidence that she held deep feelings for him. These were feelings I hadn't imagined she had. A sense of duty, yes. Devotion, yes. But nothing like what I thought she was conveying now. I'd seen her over the years show him a kind of steady custodial attention. Seen her bending to him to ask him how he felt and if he needed anything. I'd seen her tidying up around his chair, picking up wrappers and papers he'd unknowingly dropped in his lap or on the floor. I'd seen her cutting his food into the small bites he preferred so he could eat with a spoon. I'd seen her attending to him, but I had no memory of her tending to him, of her touching him in any way that wasn't brief and requisite. In my child's simplistic sense of things, this meant I'd never seen her make a gesture of love toward her father. It had been time some years, it, it had been some years since I'd sat in his lap and offered him my hands and felt his fingers with their long, neglected nails wrapped serpentinely around my wrist and sensed him come to sweetly silly life. I'd forgotten how it felt to feel him feeling. I wonder still, as I wondered that day, what she was grieving at, his, at her father's funeral, the childhood she'd lived or the one that had eluded her? Was she mourning the father she lost or the one she hadn't had? Was, the, was she weeping for a kindness recalled or a cruelty remembered? For some warmth or wit I didn't know he'd once possessed or for being reminded by his death that he'd never possessed it. I wonder what he'd done for her, done once, frequently, habitually, that had touched her. But there's a crucial difference now from then I still can't know what she was weeping for, but looking back, I'm not surprised that she was weeping. Sitting next to her, wanting to catch up to her sadness in the hope of understanding it, I was years from having any sense of, at all of the intricate texture of love for a parent, which is to say I was years from understanding love of any kind for anyone, that inseparable braiding of gratitude and hurt of what we get and what we don't, of the simplicity of what we're sure we'll feel forever, and the grand complexity of all we come to feel besides. I'll stop there. Thanks. I think there's one for you. We'll take it anyway. Ah, OK. <laughs> um, this is from the memoir about my father. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Is there a lot of Oh. I think you might want to use the one on the podium. Sure, we can do that. that. Which yeah. mic am I speaking into? Yeah, we're going to use that one. Okay. But people can hear me. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, okay, of course. I forgot about them. They didn't come. <laughs> My father's obituary in 1991 said that he died of Alzheimer's disease. 
Of course, no one, strictly speaking, dies of Alzheimer's disease. They die of other things, horrible things, that happen to them because they have Alzheimer's disease. Starvation, because you've forgotten how to eat. Pneumonia, because you've forgotten how to walk, how to sit, and your lungs suffer for that. Urinary tract infections, and ulcers. This last is what Dr. Alzheimer's original patient died of eventually, bed sores, ulcers. My father had his own version of death by Alzheimer's, and I watched it slowly overtake him without realizing what was happening, without knowing I was witnessing the approach of the end, something I felt guilty about later, since he was in my care when he died, living 40 minutes from Boston in what is called a continuing care facility. I watched him then and tried to help him as he moved from being a fairly functional person to a completely incompetent one. I was, as they say, in charge of him as he moved through some of the more humiliating and degrading stages of the disease. Even as my father had his own version of the Alzheimer's death, he had his own version of the disease itself, very different from many of the ones I'd read about. He was able until very late in the course of things to present a relatively intact surface to those, to those he was comfortable with and whose references he could follow. He held on to much of his vocabulary, though structuring it was sometimes hard. He retained his long-term memory longer than most sufferers do so that he could connect with people from his past and with me and my brothers and sister until the end of his life. Of course, the basic trajectory of the disease was always there, underlying all this and having its way with dad's brain. <clears throat> I could watch him from week to week and month to month take the next step and then another along its inevitable downward curve. But the point is, it left some recognizable things behind, as it does with most sufferers, things that mark one victim from the next, though it still may take someone who knew him before to recognize that. The mother of a man in my support group, for instance, held on to her characteristic stubbornness as she grew more and more ill. His exchanges with her came to consist mostly of her telling him what she would not ever, ever do as he was trying to persuade her that she had to do it. The group would make one suggestion or another about how to manage her, and he'd shake his head almost proudly and say, she'll never go for it. So too, with my father, the disease oddly intensified, or maybe just laid bare who he really was. Even when he was deeply gone into it, the phrases of self-effacement rose easily to his lips. Oh, don't bother. That's too much trouble. You shouldn't have to do that. His dying itself was quiet and undemanding, no great drama, not much suffering, I believe, a kind of final self-effacement. Still, by the time he died, he was nearly destroyed. To those around him at the nursing home, those who hadn't known him before, he must have seen sometimes a horror, sometimes a bad joke. There were times when he seemed like one or the other of these things to me, who had known him, who loved him. My father was an historian, a church historian. It makes his illness a bitter irony. But the irony was there in another form even before he became ill. For he was someone who seemed to have almost no interest in his own history, his personal history. He spoke only rarely of his own memories of childhood or youth, and then never at length. And I don't think he used his personal memories in coming to understand himself. In that sense, in the sense that we mean it in contemporary post-Freudian America, I don't think he did understand himself. He knew his Freud, of course. He jokingly said to me once that he was a prime example of what repression could, could accomplish. <laughs> he was speaking, I think, both of his inability to recollect much, much from his early life, even really to think about it, and of his energetic, virtually nonstop professional output. What we knew of his history, we knew mostly from his sisters and his stepmother. He seemed disconnected from it. He had no recollection, for example, of his own mother, though he was eight when she died. None. This seemed extraordinary to me. Repression, indeed. My mother was utterly different. She remembered everything about her past. She loved her own history, every detail of it. She suffered from it and reveled in it until the day she died. She could weep at 60 for a slight she'd suffered at six or 16. She could recollect forever the fabric and cut of a dress she wore on a triumphal evening in high school or the compliment someone paid her in college, or the insult. She used her memory to define herself. It was her life, and it was her weapon, sometimes her bludgeon. 
I remember one summer afternoon, the year before she died, her haranguing my visiting grandparents, then in their 80s, poor things, about a decision they made to send her away to camp when she was 12. She spoke of it as if it had happened the day before, as if it were an, ex an expulsion from a kind of Eden. She got teary. It was hell, she cried out. And I remember that in the midst of all this, as my grandfather tried to slow her down, no doubt we made mistakes, my grandmother, a vague smile on her lips, discreetly but deliberately reached up and turned off her hearing aid. <laughs> my mother wrote poetry, confessional poetry, of course, and that concentrated focus on one's own feelings, one's own remembered agony and despair and joy marked her personality as it marked her work. It was terrifying to me as a child and something I resist in myself and others as an adult, that insistence on high drama, that inability to let go of or to integrate painful memory. It was why I sought refuge then in my father's calm, his forgetfulness of self, if that's what it was. My father was the one who played with us, who wrestled, who sang goofy songs, who read to us as we all jammed together on the couch in his study, who took us to special events. But most of all, it was he who was attentively, evenly, perhaps a little abstractedly too, always the same. He was safety. Here he is then in my memory. Here, look at him, and there's a picture in the book sitting in his study, almost in silhouette in front of the one window. He's a small, handsome man, Semitic looking, which runs on the male side of his family, a strong, dark, cur down curving nose, skin that shadows to olive. He has dark hair, hair he will keep until he dies, hair that will remain untouched by gray until much later. He wears glasses when he works and often a jacket and tie. This was his room the only room in the house that revealed much of anything about him. Three of the walls were nearly covered with bookshelves, the works in them an odd mixture of his professional library, these often in German or French, and in any case of no interest at the time to me, and the books he and my mother had read for pleasure. His big desk, and even sometimes the floor around it, was always stacked with papers. One of the books he was writing while we lived on Harper Avenue, or student essays or blue books, or an article for the journal he edited, Church History. Framed pictures of figures he was interested in hung on the wall. I remember a sepia-toned photograph of the Swiss historian, Jacob Burkhardt, staring down from his desk in his study. The door onto the hall was always open. I think that open door drove my mother a bit mad. She saw her role as protecting my father's privacy. If we came into the house with a bunch of friends, she was on guard. Don't you take all those children up there. Your father's working. If we made it past her, she'd holler, are you up there bothering your father? <laughs> the study was physically at the heart of the house. The door faced the top of the only flight of stairs to the second floor. Whenever you came up, whoever came up, if you stepped just slightly forward out of your path to your own room, you could see him there at his desk, and he could see you. As he watched the parade in the hallway, he always seemed mildly amused, tolerant of us all. You could actually hide in his study from others, and he would just raise his eyebrows for a moment and then go on with what he was doing. I think, in fact, he chose the open door. He seemed to enjoy the racket. Maybe this was because his protection against it was, in a sense, built in. He simply absented himself from whatever might interfere with his thoughts. It just didn't register. My Aunt Ellen, my father's oldest sister, once counted eight, 18 children in the house when she was visiting and noted that my father was undisturbed by it. In fact, he worked through it. Clearly, the contrast with her own father was an important part of the delight she took in this. She, unlike my father, remembered my grandfather's intolerance of noise, of children, of any interruption in his sanctified routines. The study was also the room where my father read to us. He was a wonderful reader, taking all the parts in whatever the story was. He would read whatever we picked without judgment or censure. He read Winnie the Pooh and Treasure Island and Swiss Family Robinson. He read the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, which I hated and my sister loved. He read Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web, all the classics, the approved texts. But he also, when we asked him, read Archie comics and Katie Keene and Little Lulu, 
We all loved Lulu, and we especially loved the voice my father gave her, high-pitched and ridiculous, yes, but also somehow sturdily competent. Where else do I see my father? Where else do I remember him clearly? In Maine, of course, at my grandparents' camp, a group of small cabins scattered in a clearing in the woods by a pristine lake. We went there every long academic summer from the time I was three until I was in my teens. And there was no part of that experience that wasn't stamped indelibly on my mind, my heart. Even the long trips getting there. We would be packed in, three in the front seat, three in the back, the luggage area in the top of the car overloaded with duffel bags of clothing for the whole summer, with cloth diapers, with my father's papers and books, with food for the trip. There was always a dog, too, standing across several laps or sitting on someone, hot and sticky, saliva spooling down lavishly from his dangling tongue. <laughs> the interstate highway system was only beginning to be developed, so it usually took us four or five days of slow, meandering loops on two-lane roads through small towns across the Midwest, and then in Pennsylvania and across upper New York State to get there. Someone was always carsick. Someone else had to pee now. Someone had pinched someone, encroached on someone's sacred sense of space, taken all the crayons, read over someone's shoulder, breathed on someone too hard. As an adolescent, I once asked to change seats because the wind was blowing my hair against my carefully arranged do. My mother grew frantic with all of us. She reached around, slapping people randomly. Didn't matter who. That person probably deserved it or would shortly. She smoked, she yelled, she wept. In my recollection, my father never lost his temper. He kept us playing games. We sang along with him the hymns we all loved, several verses through. He sang to us his repertoire of nutty, naughty songs, Cocaine Bill and Morphine Sue. There were three jolly fishermen, the bulldog on the bank. There was 30 dirty purple birds, spoken thus. Toity doity purple boids, sitting on a coibstone munching woims and choipin' and boipin'. Along comes Goity, the goyle with the coils and the poils, and her boyfriend Hoibie, what works in his short factory in Joisy. And they saw the toity doity purple boids sitting on a coibstone munching woims and choipin' and boipin'. And they was toibed. That was it. We loved it. Do it again, Pop. <clears throat> I'm missing a part here, I think. Um, my father was more available to us in Maine than he was at home. Patiently and slowly, he taught us the skills we needed to navigate camp independently. How to row a boat, how to hold the canoe paddle, turn it, flutter it, how to do a dead man's float, how to swim, how to pull the cord on the dinky outboard motor, how to make sure you didn't flood it, how to steer the boat away from the hidden underwater rocks that studded our cove. How to cast a fly. How to troll silently. How to reel a fish in. Kill it. Clean it. What those body parts were. How they functioned. He could tell which mushrooms were poisonous, which you could eat. How to recognize the song of the thrush, of the vireo. Where you were likely to find a lady slipper. How to recognize different varieties of ferns by size, by texture, by the smell they gave off when you crushed a leaf. How to start a campfire, how to douse it. He'd been an Eagle Scout. I still have his badge. Be prepared, it says. And he tried to see that we were, for a kind of life none of us would live. He was patient and respectful, a born teacher, I think, because he was a learner himself, always curious and interested in the world and other people of any age. I remember how he embarrassed me when he drove me and my friends to dances or parties because of his careful and polite inquisition about what they were studying, what their interests and extracurricular activities were, what the, were the college that they were applying to. God, why couldn't he just be put upon and silent like most parents? My father never lost the ability to recall the names of those who had been important to him or to remember in some essential way who they were. He could remember my mother by her name, and he could remember her, not always whether she was dead or alive, but her, her being, her essence. Stories about her or about others who had been dear to him could still light his face and make him laugh. I took pride in this. 
He never didn't know me, I say now, when people say it must have been terrible. And that is almost true. There were seconds or minutes when he seemed not to know who I was, but he always greeted me warmly when I first arrived. He always understood in the first flood of pleasure our relation to each other. I knew other people whose parent or spouse had lost this part of memory nearer the beginning of the illness. I knew how painful, how isolating that was. And my gratitude that this part of his brain was left to dad, to all of us, was deep. The visual pathways in his brain began to fail. Increasingly now, he misunderstood, misread the visual. Oliver Sacks has written about our way of seeing as being learned. And scientists have begun to understand that, understand that if certain visual synapses, electrical connections between nerve cells and the various visual sim systems of the brain aren't formed and exercised, built up by a certain age, they can't be developed later. Sachs speaks of a blind patient whose sight was given to him surgically in middle age, who never learned how to see certain things. And now I watch my father as those synapses stopped working in his brain, as he unlearned seeing. Shadows became for him not the absence of light, but dark objects, as perhaps they appear to infants and little children. Their presence was inexplicable and disturbing to him. His own shadow underfoot on a sunny day, for instance, was often an irritant, a strange black animal dogging him. He would sometimes kick or swat at it as we walked along. Who could say what was going on then in what part of the brain? And what were the impediments he saw late in his illness that caused him to tiptoe so carefully around something I couldn't see, or to get down on the floor and crawl around it? Simple disturbances in his visual pathways, in the way he saw something real, or internally elicited disturbances that led him to invent something where there was nothing to hallucinate. Of course, he had delusions, too. Sometimes the delusions were painful, like the one about my sister being abducted by terrorists. I tried to reassure him that that time. I reported that I'd spoken to her and she was safe in Denver, but he couldn't be comfort comforted. <clears throat> Sorry. He persisted. He found me, I think, hard-hearted in the face of his certainty that she was in mortal danger. Finally, I called my sister and asked her to get in touch with him herself and tell him she was all right. Sometimes the delusions were pleasant. Sometimes he would have heard an old friend, often someone long dead, lecture or preach. Sometimes he'd see mother. I came to feel that these were the residue of dreams. Dreams that seemed to him no less real than the fractured reality he had to live through each day. And so in his interpretation, a part of that reality. Oddly, though the presence of hallucinations and delusions is correlated with a more rapidly advancing version of Alzheimer's, and some researchers are inclined therefore to see it as a subset of Alzheimer's, most experts believe that there is less cortical damage in the hallucinating or delusional patient at this stage of the disease. It is as though the patient needs more cortex to develop and elaborate the hallucinatory or delusional ideas. I knew neither of those facts at the time. I'm grateful, of course, not to have known the first that these symptoms are associated with a quicker arrival at what is euphemistically called the cognitive endpoint of the disease. But if I'd known the second fact, that these symptoms may indicate more cortex, I'm sure I would have taken pride in it. Why is he so crazy? Ha, because he's got more brain left. <laughs> this is how we are, after all, watching the people we love disappear. This is what is left to us. This is the comfort we can take. He was never violent. She always loved being with the children. She's just as stubborn as ever. Whatever the remotely personal characteristic that seems to have escaped the disease, we seize on it. Whatever idiosyncratic neuronal patterns still fire, still express something laid down with care and attention and love years earlier. This is important and we cling to it. He's not just an Alzheimer's victim. He's still somehow himself. He's managed to hold on to outwit this disease in this one or two or three ways. But of course I knew better. Outwitting the disease isn't possible. It isn't owing to his character. It wasn't owing to his character or depth of attachment to people that dad remembered us. It was what the disease spared while it destroyed something else. 
He could have stopped recognizing us earlier and foregone the delusions. He could have dropped verbs. There's a part of the brain specific to verbs and been stuck with a list of nouns to repeat without much skill at connecting them. It was the disease that determined what would go first in my father and what would be left, not vice versa. I remember talking about him with an old friend of mine, someone who'd known dad two years before. By then, near his death, dad was occasionally violent and I recounted that to this friend. He shook his head. Isn't it strange, he said, that under that gentle, sweet exterior there should be all that violence? A different model, this one, Freudian. One that saw the constraint of the superego eaten away by the disease and the elemental core, the uncontrolled center, the id, as still remaining, unbuffered. The violent dad who was secretly always there, emerging now that he'd lost control of himself. No, I said. No, that's not the way it worked. It was his brain, not a theoretical construct in his mind, that was being destroyed. He was organically a different person. I was trying to be pleasant and conversational, but I remember feeling a real anger, even a contempt, for my friend and his misunderstanding. Yet I indulged myself, didn't I, in the correlate belief that the good stuff he retained, he retained because of who he was because of the fineness, the excellence of who he was. And that was just as much a superstition, a fiction, but one I didn't wish to shake. And I didn't ask myself to shake it, though I did know it was a fiction. He never didn't know me, I, say proud, I said proudly. Up to the end, he knew me. Even the last time I visited him, when he was conscious, he recognized me at first. When I came into his room, he was standing by his crib bed, gripping its rails with white-knuckled intensity and staring fixedly at something he was seeing on his blanket. He was slightly bent at this point, a gentle Parkinsonian curve to his back. I spoke to him, but he didn't seem to hear me. I went over and touched him. I swung my head just under his face and looked up at him, smiling. Hi, Dad, I said. He started. Why, Susie, he said, calling me by my little girl name. And it seemed that he was actually seeing me as a little girl in that moment. His smile was so delighted, his voice so light and glad. He knew me. I clung to that, to those happy moments at the start of each visit, before I denied what he felt to be true, before I failed to respond humanely to what he reported as calamity, before I told him what I could not or would not do for him today, take him to the doctor, find his books, get his car back, before he said, as he did at least every other time I got up to leave, say, are you driving? I was wondering if maybe you could give me a lift home. Thank you. reminded in the reading, I read both memoirs this weekend and so enjoyed them, but there's something so powerful about the spoken word. I mean, if the, there's a um, cadence, I mean, I'm someone who probably reads quickly, and even though I had just read both of those passages, they really spoke to me in a whole different way by hearing you read them, so thank you for that. Um, well, I thought I'd start with the obvious question that uh, you are... Uh, so primarily a novelist, and you are a novelist and a writer of nonfiction. But uh, and um, I had a quote here, Sue, from an interview that you did, where um, you talked about um, 
You're aware, as you wrote the memoir, of your father and the lack of freedom you felt to invent, to do the play of fiction, which is one of your deepest pleasures. So maybe you could start and talk about what it was like to write memoir rather than fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it was much more um, confining in a certain way um, because, you know, I had to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to, you know, I, I obviously didn't remember verbatim everything I quoted, but I had to try to get as close as I could to what... I said to him, he said to me, someone said in the past to someone else. And that, that isn't as much, I mean, f fiction is wonderful because you sort of, it's like playing with dolls or something. You have one say, you know, I love you, and the other one say, well, I hate you. And you, know, you think, no, no, that's not right. And so you go back and you do, you do it over and over and over, and it's all self-generated, has nothing to do with what actually happened anywhere in the world. It's just your idea of what needs to happen next in this whatever you're making. Mm -hmm. And there's less making in writing nonfiction, for me anyway. Um, it's, it was, it's just harder, <clears throat> much harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took much, much longer to write mm -hmm. than any fiction I've written ever. Mm -hmm. so, um. How about for you, Doug? Um, I somewhat disagree. Um, and I think in part because my book is really a collection of essays. And I kind of came to discover the form of the personal essay in mm -hmm. writing it, and it was a great discovery for me. And um, what I love about the, the sort of narrative structure of, of, uh, of the personal essay is the way in which you can make leaps of connection that are sort of true to the general thing that you're after. But um, I, I read a lot of poetry, and I'm certainly not a poet, but for me, the personal essay has, is, is close to the form of poetry, mm. as I'll certainly ever get, uh, in that you know you you can I feel a freedom that's very different from fiction's freedom, but is equally free mm. for that reason I think. Well, it's also interesting in um, the comment I made about Edith Perlman that your essays really do jump around a little bit in yeah. time, and whereas you tell a more sequential story the way you chose to tell it here, memoir. Uh, there's a funny quote from Annie Dillard, um, who wrote a memory, memoir of her family, which she called American Childhood. And she was once asked how her parents and sisters reacted to the memoir. And she said, there were no surprises, because before she published a quote, I gave them every chapter, every page to pass on, because they're in very good health, and they have excellent lawyers. <laughs> So what was it like to write about your families and be true to the story? Uh, and then, and obviously, this is maybe too much in one question, but uh, writing about people who are passed away, mm -hmm. who maybe it's easier to be honest about, but also siblings. And um, maybe we'll start with you on that one. Um, well, both my parents were dead, uh, are dead, and were dead when I was writing that. And I couldn't have begun to write it had they either of them been living. Um, I only have one sibling, Suze comes from a much larger family. Um, and the book is dedicated to my brother, who was you know, just essential to some of the memories and recollections. He's much younger than I. Um, but when he read the book, he said, you know, it just goes to show yet again how different you are than I am. <laughs> that uh, I just like to sort of, you know, let the past be the past. Don't mess it up, don't disturb it, just kind of, and you obviously need to you know, mm -hmm. navigate it, to excavate it before you're comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the truth. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. Yeah. Um, I didn't really write very much about any of my siblings in the book. They're sort of there, right. but really just uh, as sort of part of the crowd mm -hmm. when we're together. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I worried a little about what they would think about what I wrote about my father, um, but I didn't show it to them before it got published. I mean, I didn't think they had a, a right to any of it, actually, mm -hmm. um, since I was the one who was seeing him all the time and mm -hmm. who was uh, sort of, I mean, we were scattered all over the country, so it had to be one person, essentially. Um, and, um, but they didn't, they all seemed to think it was okay. Mm -hmm. um, they nice. liked some of them liked it, <laughs> or said that. Um, anyway, but I didn't get any right. any sorrow, any grief from any mm -hmm. of them. Um, and I and I felt I think because I was writing about my father dying and so forth, 
out of a kind of necessity on my own part, I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. um, to sort of exorcise it. Um, I, it was easy for me. I mean, I wrote out of love because I, he was the, the parent that I did unquestioningly love. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, easier for me to write quite directly about him without feeling that I was wounding him or damaging him in any mm -hmm. way. Um, so if you'll allow me, I'm going to read just very brief excerpts. I'm not sure there's really a question in this, but uh, one thing that I found quite touching is your own discoveries about maybe yourself or yourselves in um, your parents' memories. So, um, so Sue mentions that after her father passes away, um, a friend writes you a, a friend of your father writes you a letter, um, and after the, his passing, and quote and says, "And did you know of one of our last meetings when his illness had already begun, and he came to our house holding his hand like a precious, even sacred object." a review of the good mother, which he showed us with shy pride. Um, and then Doug writes, he's talking about a visit his mother um, and father made to New York City when he was living there. She once told me that as a young girl growing up in Colfax, Iowa, she would believed that the streets of New York were literally paved with gold. Half a century later, finally seeing a place she held mythically in her mind for so long must have been like touring a secular heaven. When I was cleaning out her apartment after she died, I, find an, I found an odd assortment of coins she kept accumulated and kept in a Ziploc plastic bag, some shiny silver Kennedy dollars, a couple of pewter patinated 50 cent pieces. Included among them was a subway token from that trip, a chip of gold from the streets of New York. Uh, what were these discoveries like? And, and, and I mean, is part of the memory well, I don't, I'm not sure I really have a question there. Any reactions to, to those passages that I just read? Um, well, th that occurred when I, was, um, when I was sort of cleaning out my mother's apartment after she died. Um, she um, you know, had sort of organized everything very well in her life in her last years, but there was the very near necessary task of, of cleaning it out for the next tenants who were... Um, do to take it over, and it was a, it was it, it was wonderful actually. It, um, you know, I certainly I had two of our three then dogs with me when I was doing this, and it I'll never forget you know the sense of uh, the three of us, me and the two dogs, sort of claiming a space in a certain way as as I was emptying it. Um, but the one thing that was obviously still there always was her presence. Mm. Um, and it was as if the, the more vacant the apartment became, uh, the more she inhabited it mm. for me. Mm. Any comments? Um, no, I mean, there's actually the last chapter of the book is really mm. talking about the things that sort of came to me after his death. Mm. That was the most personal of them. But sort of things that people told me or that I read about him um, and I dis that I discovered about him after his death. Even one was, um, begins the book. I mean, he had wanted to be a conscientious objector in the, in the Second World War and was essentially talked out of that by mm. my grandfather, who, whom I detested, by the way. <laughs> and, and so I just could, you know, I just could re, re feel that anger that he kind of mm -hmm. denied my father that possibility, um, a sort of a, a, something he wanted to bear witness to, his, mm -hmm. his belief, which mm -hmm. is very deep. Um, but anyway, there, was a, there were just these things which I found which were wonderfully, they were like great gifts. I mean, mm -hmm. I felt, as Doug did <laughs> about his mother, um, that they were ways of knowing, this was different, because there were ways of knowing him differently from what would have been available to me, I think. Um, and, um, but they, they altered my understanding of him in some ways, and, and that was very interesting. After he died, to still be sort of in touch with him in some way, I felt. I'll take uh, one or two questions from the audience in a moment, but maybe just finish up with more of the question of kind of the it's not quite the flip side of the earlier question, but um, how those of us who read your novels and enjoy your novels wonder 
well, are these some people that they know in real life that they and uh, uh, then infuse their characters in you? Um, Sue, right, of uh, your father painstakingly going through all the letters that your mother had written to him, reading them, and then tearing them up, which you then, a totally different character, but use in a novel. Um, mm -hmm. And you've also used this funny example that he once mispronounced Boogie Woogie as Boogie Woogie, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which you had a character say. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But how often do you take things that you see and um, bring those into your Oh, novels? all the time. I mean, I don't take a whole person mm -hmm. ever, but um, they're just things that you know strike you as you as you move through life that are funny or mm -hmm. that you that you that suddenly occur to you as a way of um, shedding more light on whatever it is that you're writing fictionally at the time. Um, uh, that's the way those things occur to me suddenly. I just sort of think this would be I could really use this. Mm -hmm. This would be great. You know, mm -hmm. I think of it as an homage, uh -huh. I guess, in right. some uh -huh. way or another to whoever I'm robbing. So and. Um, I realize in your novel, the protagonist has a life in Cheyenne, which, as I was rereading your memoir, I realized that your mother had a similar, um, but same question, how often do you take things from? Well, that, that novel, um, the third novel, um, I was, is the closest I've, ever, I've come to borrowing from mm -hmm. uh, my parents' lives. Um, and I actually um, um, asked them very pertinently about their time in Cheyenne. My father was stationed in the army in World War II in Cheyenne, and it was the best time they ever had mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a magical time for them. And the character of the um, young mother in the novel certainly owes her, her sort of spirit, if you will, to some of what I glean from how my mother in particular and my, and my father lived during that time. But for the most part, um, my fiction is very uh, unlike my own experience of, or those around me, at least as I can remember it or note it. Because the moment I sort of am conscious of being close to my own experience in any way, it goes directly to nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And when I'm writing fiction, I have to really kind of invent it from whole cloth. Mm. So. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, please. I had um, a question primarily for um, Doug, but Sue can certainly um, answer it as well as if it applies. I just was curious about, well, I'm sure it does not apply actually, in terms of the writing process, um, I was struck by the passages and sort of the range of emotion that you were able to, to capture and just Thank you. sort of the distance um, and just the, what felt like a, a real distance in emotions that you felt for your parents, um, and probably this also applies to Sue as she was um, writing about her father. I'm curious if the writing itself, in terms of the process of working on the book and the sort of pre-writing that took place and the drafts before it, or maybe just other writing that you did, if that was instrumental in you being able to shift feeling for your parent. Um, so if that sort of process gave you the ability to look at your parent with a different view, if the writing was mm -hmm. in some way healing. Um, yeah. Um, no, I think, I think you said, well, that I, I did need a kind of necessary distance in order to write with what I hope was feeling. Um, you know, if I was still so close to either of them or to the to sort of the, the nearness of, of, of life with them, I don't think I would have been able to get, it sounds almost counterintuitive or ironic, but I don't think I would have been far enough in the writing to get close enough in the result, if that makes any sense. Um, someone once, a writing teacher of mine said that, you know, you have, to, you have to be so, you have to think of it as like a sculptor's clay. It has to be that dismissible and malleable, and you have to be that ruthless, was the word he used. And I, I did bring a kind of ruthlessness to the writing of, the, of it, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was 
great. Well, thanks. <laughs> Any comments? Sir? No. Okay. Other, Charlie. Uh, my question is going to come down to, I guess, why do you, why do you write memoir? But, but let me get to it somewhat. <laughs> As you were talking, I was thinking about the difference between writing memoir and writing biography. And and yes, the difference for a fiction writer is that you are you are you are constrained by fact if you're a biographer and you write with research. And I guess in the in, in writing a memoir, you write through the prism of memory and the, and obviously the prism of love. So. Why, what did you want to achieve, I guess, I come back to it, with, with these memoirs? Is it to do honor to those people that, about whom you write? Is it to engender memory for yourself? Do you write for yourself or are you writing for others? What is, the, what is it that you want to achieve with those, with that, with those writings? So why don't you start? One of the things I wanted to achieve it was when my dad was suffering from was suffering and dying from Alzheimer's disease. There, first of all, we didn't know as much about it, anywhere near as much. The sort of the '90s. He died in 1991, and the '90s were the period in time when there were all these discoveries being made about the brain because there were these new techniques for looking at what was going on in the brain when certain things were happening to the person. So. Um, I was interested in um, in writing something that would that would be informative to someone in my position about the processes of the disease, and I did an enormous amount of research. I thought I, there were the sort of the literature was either very very medical when you if for, when I was trying to find out about things, or it was sort of this conventional you know you need to have a hobby, you need to take care of yourself, you need to join a group, that kind of thing, and I just found it. So both ends of that so unhelpful. So my aim was to write a book that would explain, and there's a lot of explanation of the medical parts of it in the interwoven with the parts about my dad. So it started that way actually, but then I think for me, it was a way of coming to terms with my grief that just seemed um, unending and insoluble. And I think it was essential to me as a human being to have written this book really. I was in trouble. And for, I recommend it highly. And you really go into that quite a bit in the last few chapters of our last few sections of the book. Um, it's just beautifully, beautifully written. We'll have Doug speak and then your question. Would you update it today? Would you update it today, given what's been learned, although it's not much, <laughs> about, about what Alzheimer's? Yeah, I don't think I would touch it. You know, I'm, I feel as though it's enough. The general question to you. Um, I think I needed, I think my brother was right, you know, that I needed to uh, in, sort of excavate a lot of the experience that I was um, unsettled about in my feelings about my parents. Um, I had a very complicated relationship with both of them. Um, I didn't have that kind of unquestioning love that Sue had for her father, which was quite richly deserved, by the way. Her father was an extraordinary human being. Um, and for me, I, I wanted to kind of, not put to rest, but um, to, to get that distance that I was talking about earlier so that I could almost um, work through um, some of the real ambivalences that I was Carrying around. What well, I hear you both saying, though, it comes back to that issue in between biography and memoir mm -hmm. that you do, in, in many respects, write for yourself. That oh, that's, that that's primarily who you are. Writing. For me, no question. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I'm writing for myself first, and then others. I hope. <laughs> yes, well. I'll, I'll make a joke of. of People don't know this is Charles Gibson of ABC News. I was going to say, the red light is on at the presidential debate, Mr. Gibson. And <laughs> <laughs> you've used your fully allotted time. Go ahead. Yeah, so the nuts and bolts question, it actually follows a bit from the previous two, two questions, good questions. And, and that is, um, the book is acclaimed. And I kind of get it why it's acclaimed. And one idea, of course, is the story itself is compelling. Another is that the author 
author is just so talented and perceptive and is able to weave the story to the readers compellingly. And I want to ask, uh, were there, uh, are there uh, writing techniques or organizational features that you use to do a successful memoir? Hmm. You want to start? No, you start. Okay. <laughs> Um, I take uh, a lot of sort of pre-first draft notes. You know, almost, they almost they, they kind of flow from phrases to sentences, from phrases to sentences. They get closer in the way that a painter sort of sketches without kind of critically attending to what he, he's doing. And I take a, a lot of legal pad pages of notes and kind of work my way in. I I guess is the way that I think about it. Um, I started as, a, as a, a, a magazine journalist, a freelance journalist, and I made my living at that when I was a kid uh, for about a decade. And um, the thing I've, I loved about that experience among many was that I thought of it as a job. Um, you know, I, I was doing magazine work, and if I didn't get the piece in on time, I didn't get paid. I didn't get paid, I didn't eat. And it, it kind of has a wonderful uh, demystifying uh, effect on the process for me, if I think of it as my job, as work, that is, is not quite so exalted. If... So, I... Well, I, this book was unique for me because I had a tremendous, I had actually hired a researcher who had access to the Harvard Medical Libraries, and she just brought me articles and a lot of information. So I had that to digest, and then somehow to integrate with the passages um, that were about specifically about one person, my father. So it was a matter of sort of having two different <laughs> books, I suppose, in some way, and then finding a way to to knit them together that wasn't this is this and this is this. But as in the part that I read about my father um, sort of having visu these visual issues, I mean, there were several thing, other things that I cited as examples of that that were funny sometimes or odd. Um, but I just kept going through. I mean, I had a lot of work after I'd taken notes, after I'd sort of known what I wanted to do of, of weaving those two very different aspects of the book together to make it easy to take in the, the information that I was trying to convey about the illness um, by make me, making this connection to the person that I loved who had it. But that's different from the way I work with fiction, I have to say. Yeah. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes, please, sir. If you keep journals, did you go back and consult those when you did these essays? Or um, I don't keep journals as a, as a matter of routine. Um, and these were generated really quite specifically for this, for this book, um, which I, in a funny way, I don't, th I don't think of as a memoir necessarily, um, but rather as this collection of essays that really have much more to do with, um, well, what I've been talking about here tonight. Um, so... And I don't keep journals at all, but I write in longhand for the first draft, so I have books and books. And, I, and that's um, I, in part because it's, it's sort of, let, it's, it, it, I, it's more free-flowing. I mean, it, it, I'm not responsible for the words that I write. I don't try to make it beautiful writing at all. It's sort of like a combination of note-making and then suddenly I'll, I'll think of a quote. You could, you, I could do this. I could have her say this. Or, you know, remember that thing you wrote like 10 pages ago or in the other book? I mean, so it's a scrabbled thing that eventually I have to be able to type something in on the computer because then I work with revision on the computer. But again, pulling it out and writing all over it and writing all over it. So I do keep a journal in that sense. And I have all the, all the notebooks that I have used to write the novels, which are a lot of notebooks. And they do include some sort of just very personal notes about what I'm doing. But I don't write about myself. I don't do that at all. So it's just fiction for the most part. Yeah. 
Uh, so I'll end with just a couple of quotes. Uh, remind everyone there's a book signing this evening. For those of you watching, the signed books will be available at the Concord Bookshop. Uh, so we hope you'll come and purchase the books uh, over the next few days. Um, I had jotted down, uh, Doug had mentioned this kind of lighthearted moment in his parents' life when they were living in Cheyenne. And there's a lovely line there. He, he has pictures of them wearing funny clothes that you wouldn't normally see them in, like cowboy boots. or um, And uh, he sees this kind of lighthearted life of theirs, and he writes that at first he thought they were, quote, dressing up for adult life, because they were just at the beginning of their marriage. But then he realized it was more the opposite. They were dressing up to postpone adult life, despite Doug's infant presence, um, which perhaps brought them to reality. And I'll, I'll close the final with... Uh, Final words, a review of Doug's book. As this memoir reaffirms, we live and love, and the years pass to be relived in memory of those who follow. So we thank you, Doug and Sue, for being here with us to relive these memories and the lessons they impart to us all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. So we'll have Doug and Sue over here with Dawn from the Concord Bookshop and uh, have the book sign. Let me clear, clear a pathway. Uh, I, yeah. I think I can make it. I'll just hold on to the hold on so come yeah. across. Yeah. And we can Great. take your microphones off. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. But, um, Thank you. Um, Thank you. That's great.